what in the world is happening before Yeshua returns. So many people in the Christian world think the next thing that's going to happen on planet Earth, the next prophecy to be fulfilled, is the return of the Messiah. Well, that seems to indicate a great ignorance of the prophetic scriptures, and we have with us New York Times best-selling author, Joel Richardson, a prolific author, and an expert in the Middle East and Islam especially, and we are going to take a look at what the prophets say about the snare that is being set before the President of the United States at this very time, what has been set before the nations of this world, and that is this fraudulent concept of peace in the Middle East. Joel, good to have you back with us. Great to be back, Michael. Well, Joel, let's uh, let's step into these prophetic scriptures. Let's uh, let's talk about this a, a little bit uh, because, uh, again, there are a lot of things that are going to be happening and must transpire before Yeshua returns. A number of years ago, I wrote the book, The Mystery of Iniquity, which uh, the subtitle is the um, the legal prerequisites to the return of the Messiah. Mm -hmm. uh, in indicating that there are prophecies, these things must be fulfilled. It's not an option, just as it's not an option for the Almighty to scorch the, the earth tomorrow or to, to uh, overcome it with the waters of a flood. It just cannot be done because he has given his word and the universe is spun around his word. Mm -hmm. And so there are other things that must take place and actually we're seeing them take place now, are we not? Moving in that direction for sure. You know, whenever people ask, they say, what is, the, what is the major signpost to watch for to know that we're entering into that final seven-year period right before the return of Jesus? And I think most prophecy teachers would say probably the most significant event is either the signing of some type of a covenant or perhaps strengthening a pre-existing covenant. We're not fully sure. But in Daniel 9, really 24 through 27, 24, 25, 26, 27, this, these four little verses, there is a whole bunch. In one of the references, it says that the Antichrist will either strengthen or make a strong covenant with the many. And most uh, or many commentators believe that this is going to be some type of treaty between the Antichrist and Israel, perhaps a security agreement perhaps a covenant, we're not sure of the exact specifics, but a lot of people point to that. Now, it's interesting that right now, sort of the golden egg, I mean, that which the prize that every American president is, is looked for to be the one that could attain what all his predecessors were not able to, is the ability to mediate a peace process between Israel and the Palestinians. And you open the show by saying, what is the snare? What is the trap that is being set for this current president? And not just for the president, but for the whole world, for the Israeli government. I mean, the fact that we're even talking about the potential for some type of a covenant, an agreement, a treaty. First of all, it's a fundamental violation of Torah. It's a violation of God's commandments to his people um, at Moses, but repeatedly, I mean, repeatedly the Lord, as the Hebrews were coming up into the promised land. He said this, he goes, listen, when you go into the land, when you're, when the land that you're about to enter into, when you, when you see the people there, don't enter into alliances, agreements, marriages, covenants. The Lord takes covenant, the Lord takes marriage very seriously. Mm -hmm. And he says, because if you do it, they will lead you astray to worship other gods. If you give your sons to their daughters, their daughters to your sons to be married, it will be a snare unto you. Now, I know there's probably not a lot of folks out there today that still hunt with snares and, you know, and bear traps and this sort of thing. But, you know, the Bible uses different analogies. It talks about, you know, this or that is a light unto my path. This is a stumbling block. This is, a snare is not a stumbling block. A stare, snare is not something that trips you up. A snare is intended to kill you. Mm -hmm. You know, you see a little fox, a little animal gets caught in a snare and they're all ripped up and their skin shredded and they're, I mean, 
the Lord says, don't do this. It will be your demise. Yeah, that's right. Now, uh, when we read about this, that, that word comes up in uh, Matthew 24. Many shall be offended. The word is scandalizo, which is the Greek word for snare. And a mm. snare is set uh, to, to capture an animal in the course of its normal activities. It's not like a trap, like a mouse trap, where it's baited. Uh, in police work, that's called entrapment. But when you catch somebody doing something they're doing anyway, that is a scandal, uh, and that is when you catch someone in the snare of them going down the same path that they've always gone down before, and it, it, it's a, a perfect an analogy here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so now we've got, you know, as far as a snare, there's a snare that's being set for the world for what, what's about to transpire. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I look at other analogies, I mean, just in the natural. Uh, you look off the coast of Florida and they'll say, oh, tropical storm, something or other is developing. It begins with this little tropical swell. Next thing you know, you look on the news, you see this map, and there's just this, this hurricane that is engulfing, you know, the entire, all the Gulf states or the whole East Coast. And it's just, there's this massive eye and it's just pulling into its, into its wake, just, you know, thousands of miles. Well, really, Jerusalem is the eye of the storm. And because God, the God of creation, the Almighty, has made covenant, Satan is enraged. And if you want to go, what are the, what are the last days? It's very simple. The last days is, is when that tropical storm that's, you know, been gathering and growing out there in the Caribbean somewhere becomes the hurricane. Eventually, it's going to engulf the whole world. The whole world, like a magnet, is going to be pulled into the eye of this covenantal battle for Jerusalem, for the eventual enthronement of the son of David on the throne of David on Mount Zion in Jerusalem. And so that's what it is. There's, there's this trap, this snare, this storm that's going to engulf the nations. But it all seems to begin sort of the, the, the linchpin, if you will, of this whole thing is this, again, this prize, this political prize of a peace treaty, of the peace process between Israel and the Palestinians. And I know President Trump is the author of the book, The Art of the Deal. And he stepped into office, and right off the top, he's really looking forward to being the one who, is, who can finally negotiate that coveted deal between the Palestinians, Mahmoud Abbas, and Netanyahu. And, you know, this, we're already in the thick of it in the mm -hmm. negotiations and so forth. Um, I personally believe it's a snare. I believe if we simply understand the reality on the ground, we understand the intentions of the Palestinian leadership, the nature on the ground of what's unfolding, I believe it's a trap. I believe it's a mistake. Go on, make the United States stronger, cut taxes, put in conservative judges, do all of those things. But when you start messing with Israel, when you start messing with the promised land, when you start touching the apple of God's eye, that, that rock that it says, you know, the nations that try to lift it, it says it actually, the language that's used is they will be ruptured. In other words, it's speaking of a, a hernia. You know, you, all who try to lift it, they'll actually be ruptured. Um, I believe this is hands off. And I'm praying that the Lord would give this current administration wisdom. Because the only thing, if you understand the reality on the ground, the only thing that makes sense is to give and empower the, the Israel. You give the Jewish people the, uh, the right and the ability to defend themselves against a people who the majority of which desire to wipe them out. Mm -hmm. You empower those who are defending themselves. Well, this is one of the things, the, the encouraging thing that I saw with Trump and how he handled this uh, with the meeting with uh, Netanyahu, uh, saying one state, two state, you know, it's more like you have to work it out and recognizing this problem that they have, that you can't negotiate with people that want to kill you. Right. Uh, you know, you say, you know, well, we want to wipe uh, all the Jews off the face of the earth. Well, how do you compromise with that? Well, how about if we just wipe off half of them? Is right. that how you compromise? You know, it, at least there was a glimmer of hope. It's like one state, two state, you know, it, it's, it's not in our hands and hopefully, uh, the, our, our president will be smart enough not to stick his neck too far into this thing, but to stand with Israel and support Israel. Because again, uh, if you curse Israel, you're going to be cursed. 
you're going to pay the price. And this is the very thing that we, we saw happen at the time. The United States promised a billion dollars to Israel to resettle those who were taken from their homes in the Gaza where they'd grown up, you know, two generations down there, pulled all the people out. The United States said that they were going to give a billion dollars. Well, at the very day that they started pulling those people out, a no-name storm out in the Atlantic started to swirl, and when it hit the coast of the United States, 100 times more Americans were put out of their homes than those who were taken out of their homes uh, in the Gaza area down there. Yeah. See, that curse against Israel, and this is, you know, trying to use our power in the United States, our economic power and all, in order to exert pressure to get Israel to do things that, that it's against God's covenant. All the land from the Euphrates to the great river in Egypt belongs to the sons of Israel. And this is, this is God's covenant with Abraham. That is what circumcision is all about. It is a sign of that covenant. It's, it, it's not a sign you're a Jew. No, it's a sign that that land belongs to the sons of Israel. Right. You don't even get to keep Passover on the Temple Mount unless you are under that sign. And, and what has happened? We see our president's trying to mess with that covenant with Abraham. Right, you know, and it's the spirit of the age. Everyone seems to put all of the, the onus, all of the pressure, all of the burden on Israel, they, as if they're the ones that are responsible. You know, I, I always say the message of the world to believers, the message of the world to the church, to the messianic community, really, if you boil it down, it's this. Shut up and go feed the poor. You know, the world loves it when we go minister to the poor, when we serve the needy. They, oh, that's wonderful. You go do your little acts of service, but shut up with your message. You go, yeah, we're going to continue to feed the poor. We're going to do it more diligently, but we're not going to shut up. The message of the world to the Jews is roll over and die. You know, do you remember uh, Helen Thomas? She was sort of that fam famous <laughs> rabble rouser in the White House press corps. NPR. And yeah. she comes out and she, they said, well, wait a minute. She was complaining about Israel. And they said, well, well, what should they do? And she goes, they need to go the hell back to Europe. That's what they need to do. And you go, whoa, wait a minute, what? You know, I mean, this is the message of the world. They have no right to be there. They invaded these other people that, you know, all this kind of nonsense. Go back to Europe. Okay, well, what's going on in Europe? Anti-Semitism is exploding. So really the message of the world, when you really boil it down, is just roll over and die so we can finally have peace. So there's right. this constant We don't want push. your God. We want no remembrance of your God. We want no moral restraints whatsoever. We want to live our life the way we want to without any repercussions or even thought that we will stand before a righteous judge, which is represented by the nation of Israel as his prophets to the world. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's a, Israel is a thorn in the side of the world that says the day of the Lord is indeed coming. That, you know, as I write in my book, when a Jew rules the world, the day is oh, coming. Oh, I love, I love that. Beautiful. When a Jew rules the world, this is the day that we're all looking forward to. Exactly. Well, we are. There's a day, yeah, some of us are. There's a day coming, I always like to just put it in raw context. A Jewish man is coming back to engage in a hostile takeover of the earth. And that's offensive enough as it is, but the day is coming when everyone will stand before him. Everyone, Helen Thomas, will give an account for the deeds done in this life, whether good mm -hmm. or bad. And a Jewish man is going to judge the nations. Yeah. I mean, this, this is a serious thing. And yeah, so Israel is a constant reminder in the side of the nations the day is coming when this Jewish man is coming back, that he has been chosen, he has been appointed to rule the nations by the Almighty. It's offensive. It's offensive to a lot of the world, but it's that offense that is required to, to get to that corrupt, wicked, festering wickedness that lies within every one of us. And if we don't acknowledge it and repent of it, then that day will fall upon us like a rock and grind us to powder. Fall on the rock and be broken, lest that day come and crush you. Really, what we are talking about is, is Isaiah's prophecy yeah. concerning this covenant with death, this agreement with hell, that Israel's leaders would do wickedly against the covenant. Right. And that covenant is the covenant that Almighty God made with Abraham, of which all the land from the Euphrates to the Nile, I say the Nile, it says the great river in Egypt, I say let's take it all the way, take it as far as we can, let the Almighty figure it out if it's gonna be less than that. But all that land belongs to the sons of Israel. And uh, Joshua was told, you are not gonna get all the land at once. 
You know, you go into the land, if I gave it to you all at once, your number is not sufficient to inhabit the land. The wild beast would come in and overrun the land before you grew in a number large enough for that. I'm going to give it to you by little and little. Mm -hmm. in this, but yet that covenant remains firm, yep. that all this land belongs to the sons of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, mm -hmm. and nothing is going to, to stop that from happening. I say, you know, it's the uh, uh, 4,000 years ago, the creator of the heavens and the earth made an everlasting covenant with Abraham. All the land from the Euphrates to the Nile belongs to the sons of Israel. Shockwaves will shake the earth as heaven reaches down to fulfill that covenant, and every nation that stands against that covenant will find themselves on the battlefield against the Almighty. Right. This, this covenant, this is a major thing, and this is what... This is what our nation's leaders, this is what the United Nations, this is what the world is going against that covenant. To try to get Israel to go away, to give land for the promise of peace. And Isaiah says that the Almighty will annul that covenant with death. Yeah. Their agreement with hell will not stand. There will be an overflowing scourge. Violence will interrupt that very thing. Yeah. Yep. And so now we've got uh, a president who's got it on his plate. And, and, and you know, we, we know that this is the art of the deal. Why yeah. wouldn't he want to go there? Yeah. Just by the five senses. Right. May the Almighty interrupt this thing to where at least what we do is stand with Israel. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, look, initially President Trump said that he would move the capital of Israel to Jerusalem. Everyone said, Yahoo. All of those in the believing community said, Yahoo. It seems to be as though that he has backed off on that because it doesn't seem to be pragmatic. And so we are seeing that many of the uh, some, some somewhat flamboyant promises maybe made on the campaign trail, he's now facing the pragmatic realities now that he's in office. And the truth is most of us welcome that to a degree. You know, some of it we welcome. Mm -hmm. um, reality is always a little bit, you know, it's always easy to sort of criticize from the outside and, and comment on things from the outside. But when you're in someone's shoes, Okay, now you have to deal with reality. Well, hopefully he'll, in terms of this issue of the peace deal, he'll realize, oh, you know, it sounds good to say we're going to have a peace deal, but in truth, the reality is the best thing we can do is simply give the Israelis the tools to live at peace and to defend themselves. Now, listen, you, have, you really have two yeah. issues sort of, um, co well, not contradicting, but um, in conflict in Torah. On one hand, don't enter into agreements, covenants with the pagans because they worship other gods. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, in modern times, this sounds so uh, intolerant. You know, oh, you know, they're called to go in and wipe out all of the inhabitants of the land. Well, you have to understand, these people were sacrificing their children to Molech. They were engaging in orgies, thinking that they can get the fertility gods and goddesses to make, you know, just the perversion, the corruption, the wickedness, not to mention the corruption of, of the seed. Uh, through the Nephilim and their descendants and just all that was going on there, God says... Yeah, complete debauchery that who knows what was stopped because they were stopped in their, in their tracks at that time. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, people say, well, okay, so that's back then, but, you know, the Palestinians today, they're not sacrificing their children to Molech. Huh. And you go, um, he might not be called Molech anymore, but they are indeed sacrificing... The God of death. The God of death. They, they treasure death more than... They said to the Persians, more than they love drinking their wine. Yeah, or yeah, yeah. as Gold in My Ears said, we'll have peace when the Palestinians love their children more than they hate yeah. the Jews. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's very simple. But now there is the other reality. The Torah also commands the Jews to treat the strangers, the inhabitants that live in the land, as if it's one of their own. So they're commanded to treat their enemies with kindness. It doesn't mean that they're to sacrifice themselves and live foolishly, but there is this command to live in a righteous, generous way. And in fact, the Israelis mm -hmm. largely are a very generous people. Oh, yeah. They're treating uh, Syrian fighters, they're bringing in Syrians and different people and treating them in the hospitals, they're treating Palestinians. Look, they live with a higher ethical standard and yet a higher level of criticism than virtually any nation in the world. But there is this reality. I, what I'm trying to say is Israel is not called just to wipe the Palestinians out. That's not their call. But they, are, they, they must resist this temptation, the way of the world, the spirit of the age, to try to buy into the deception, the snare, that they need to enter into some sort of comprehensive peace treaty. No, Israel simply has to continue to be righteous, mm -hmm. to treat them with kindness, but by all means defend themselves, protect their people. That's what government is established for. And by the grace of God, the Lord will continue to give wisdom to this current administration and that he'll partner with that, that program for wisdom as well. 
we uh, we, we see this uh, uh, this this covenant with death, this uh, agreement with hell. Uh, we, we see those words of Isaiah really uh, echoed into the past, all the way back to to, to Abraham's covenant with all, the Almighty and Israel's commandment not to enter into covenants with those people. Mm -hmm. And and uh, you know th this was one of the the big things that happened uh, uh, in in my life. Uh, uh, it was uh, now well over 40 years ago. Began working on the chronological gospels, and in that was the biblical calendar, uh, mm -hmm. which you have to understand that that very thing first. But it was in 1993 when Israel entered into the Oslo Peace Accord that that, that every bit of that was, was echoed in Isaiah's prophecy. That, but it may not have been the final, final fulfillment, but we saw everything about that. Israel's leaders doing wickedly against the covenant. They make an agreement with, uh, with, uh, with hell, a covenant with death. Um, and, and in that, they, they promised that they would uh, give over land for the promise of peace, mm -hmm. which is, and the Almighty said, I will annul your coming with death. Well, that happened to be, by their own terminology, there's a sign in the White House lot, a seven-year agreement. And so the Almighty is saying that he would annul their covenant with death. That's why in the spring of the year uh, uh, 2000, uh, uh, yeah, the spring of the year 2000, I said, if we have accurately corrected the calendar this year for the Aviv, we will see violence erupt in Jerusalem before sundown September 28th. Mm. Now, I said that not because there was any revelation. It's simply this covenant with death fit this so precisely that if the Almighty is going to annul this covenant with death and he's going to do it by violence, it has to be done before sundown September 28th because that is exactly seven years. From Yom Teruah to Yom Teruah is exactly seven years. It would have to happen before sunset. That was the day Ero Sharon that morning went up on the Temple Mount opened the book of uh, Ezekiel from his wife's Bible, mm. uh, who was a Messianic Jew mm. that passed away. He read that, and that's when the second intifada began, right then. Mm. That ancient prophecy being fulfilled today, and that's why I say Bible prophecy is being fulfilled today. Sure. But it may not be the final fulfillment of that. Right. Because we saw, you know, from there, they had another uh, uh, agreement that was at Camp David that summer. Mm -hmm. Seven years later is again a seven-year agreement, and so people are again looking at: Is this is, is this uh, the the prophecy of Daniel? Yep. And then uh, and then seven years later, it was Camp David. Seven years later, it was Annapolis. Three times seven, you know, right right down the line. And each one of these things, uh, Joel, it looks like we are being told by heaven: Look up. Look up, I am active, I am doing things, I'm fulfilling my word, I'm giving you advanced warning, yeah. because this thing, this thing is gonna get, get really rough. As, uh, as the trumpet of Joel, which is your, uh, uh, your, your uh, nomenclature, um, uh, we, we see that uh, we got big things that are going to be happening, do we not? Yeah, absolutely, I mean, I think that's the reason Jesus uses the analogy of birth pangs. You know, it's very simple. Birth pangs come. You have your first child. You have what's called the Braxton Hicks. You go, oh, I think this is it. You run to the hospital. No, that's not it. But there are sort of these waves, these repeated um, echoes of that which is going to come to a culmination in the last days with the ultimate covenant with death, if you will. And we've been given fair warning. You know, we've been given these, these waves of foreshadows of what's to come. And I truly believe that we are quick, quickly approaching that final, that final period that will initiate those final seven years. I mean, we're moving rapidly toward that time. Amen. We, we Amen. We, we are. Yeah, we have not hit it, but we are moving right. rapidly toward that.